virgin continent. So the bladder is like I told you, it's kind of like a balloon. It's full of fluid and it has a muscle a wall around it. And so with urge incontinence, that muscle wall is irritable and it's wanting to squeeze and make people feel like they have to urinate or actually squeeze urine out at not the right time, you know, not when they're uh, on the toilet. So that is urge incontinence. There's overflow incontinence. Maybe someone has a blockage uh, that urine doesn't come out easily or their bladder is maybe in the wrong place. So they are, they just start, urine just starts forcing itself out because the bladder kind of gets over full. Um, and then mixed incontinence usually means a mixture of stress incontinence and urge incontinence. And that's, that's actually quite common. There's also a, a functional incontinence and that really means it's more of uh, someone is leaking urine because they their bladder works fine, their brain is working fine, but they just physically cannot make it to the bathroom on time. Maybe they um, have difficulty with mobility or, um, and that would be like a functional incontinence. And I'm, I'm not gonna go over, over that one. Um, so incontinence is very common. Um, and the numbers I found were for stress incontinence and urge incontinence. So stress incontinence is about 15% of adult women. Um, if, and you can see it gets more common with age. So women over 30 years old, it's uh, 24 to 45%. Over 40 years, about 41%. Um, folks who are elderly in a nursing facility it would be 77%. Um, about 77% of women would consider it bothersome and 28% severe. And then urge incontinence is 9% in women from 40 to 40. 31% in women from uh, over 75. So it becomes more common with age. And it's common in general, so a prevalent issue. What do we think about when we think about conditions or illnesses? We might think about, well, what, what things might make someone at risk for that problem? Or we would say risk factors. So it might be having vaginal deliveries, menopause, some chronic cough, constipation, repetitive strain. Um, they've looked at some interesting populations that have higher rates of incontinence. One, I think is kind of funny, is, is women in the military who jump out of airplanes, <laughs> just, you know, a small group, I'm sure. But all that repetitive stress um, can lead to incontinence. Women who work in cafeterias, they've looked at them or just for years or lifting really heavy things. Um, pelvic surgery. Obesity, even the extra weight that we carry can push on our bladder and force urine out. Um, diabetes is a risk factor. Um, and so when someone uh, goes for an evaluation of, of incontinence, these are things that uh, we might be looking, looking at or asking about. So obviously we want to know about their symptoms. You know, when do they leak? How much do they leak? You know, are they wearing panty liners every day? Are they wearing pads? Are they we want to know about their habits. Do they are they drinking lots of water? I've talked to lots of patients. They start leaking a little urine or leaking urine, and they increase their fluid intake. They're drinking more water, and sometimes that exacerbates things. Um, uh, we might ask patients to keep or send in a bladder diary, and that is a record of well, when are they going? How much they might even we might even give them a little hat for their toilet to actually measure how much urine comes out and measure how much they're drinking for, for two or three days just to get an idea of the pattern of um, urination. We want to know about medical history, obstetric history, medications or medications that might make someone more prone to making lots of urine, like a, maybe someone's on a diuretic or a pill to pull extra fluid off. Um, that can make <coughs> us have difficulty with um, lots of urine there in the full bladder, which makes you more likely to leak a lot of times. Um, I'd like to know about surgical history if someone had any, particularly any pelvic surgery, any urologic surgery in the past. On a physical exam, a patient should have their vital signs taken, an abdominal exam, we just make sure is there something of enlarged uterus or something that's pushing down on the bladder. Um, pelvic exam, the information that might give us has to do with um, are, are the 
bladder or the, in the uterus and the rectum, are they in the right place? Or when someone strains, do they come out of place? So probably one of the more common reasons for stress, urinary incontinence, is that the, and I'll, show, I'll get to a picture, it'll make it a little more clear, but the bladder and the opening of the bladder is called the urethra and the bladder neck, and there's the urethra is a little tube where urine is coming out. And when people strain, sometimes it falls down towards the vaginal opening and it, and it, because it falls down, it actually goes outside the, the kind of protective pressure of the abdominal cavity and it, it allows urine to leak through that little tube of the urethra, that stress incontinence. So we wanna know kind of where the bladder sits when people are straining. Um, and sometimes we'll want to know how well women empty their bladder. So the practitioner might say, well, go empty your bladder. And when you come back, we're either gonna look, sometimes these days we'll look with an ultrasound and see, is there, can we still see urine left in the bladder? Is it a little bit or a lot? Um, and usually, usually, I've been doing this a while, so usually well, sometimes we'll put a little catheter in even and see how much urine is left. Um, and then we can send that urine for uh, testing Next. So any lab or testing, you might have a urinalysis, and that is a test where we send the urine off, and you're looking for things like infection, like if someone maybe they have a bladder infection that's irritating their bladder and causing it to squeeze urine out when it's not supposed to come out, um, or blood in their urine, maybe they might indicate kidney stones or, or something that's irritating the bladder. Uh, urine culture will help us look for infection. We might want to make sure someone's had a recent um, some recent blood work to make sure they don't have diabetes. Some patients I see her peeing, particularly they're urinating a lot. Um, they might they might have trouble with their blood sugars being too high. Um, and then you might hear about something called urodynamics. That is a, a little diagram of urodynamics. That might generally that might be testing someone would have before they are considering a surgical procedure for incontinence, or if they just have a really complex enough history of problems that it might be difficult for their uh, physician to tell what's going on. But uh, with urodynamics, the bladder is filled with uh, measured amounts of still saline, and then there are little, all the little lines with the little manometers, or they're measuring pressure um, in the vagina and pressure in the bladder, and they're measuring what kind of pressure the bladder tolerates before someone starts leaking leaking that fluid. So probably not a super common test, but if someone was facing surgery, that might be something that the surgeon wants information they want to know. So I'm going to go over some treatment options, and I've split it mainly into stress incontinence and urge incontinence. There is a little overlap with some of these. And uh, again, a lot of um, ladies might be experiencing both kinds of urine loss at the same time. Um, so I have a list here, and then as I, the next slides, we'll go a little more into each one. So with stress incontinence, again, that's that loss of urine, but cough, sneeze, stand, it's, it's pressure that's pushing down. And so some lifestyle things to consider, what is weight loss? So some women, if they'll lose a, a little weight, they won't have as much trouble with that. They might need to address why they have a chronic cough. They're, for a variety of reasons, people might cough a lot, whether it's a medication or um, infection, something that might help a reflux. Um, they might avoid heavy lifting. Sometimes I'll see ladies who are linking them and I'll look at them and they live on a farm and they're lifting 50 pound bags of feed. <laughs> we'll just kind of talk about whether they, do they, is that something that they need to do? Sometimes they just can't change that, but if they could change it, um, sometimes that is helpful. Probably everyone has heard about Kegel exercises or um, some exercises uh, to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, and we'll have a diagram of those. Um, weighted vaginal combs, those help strengthen those muscles. Um, we'll have a picture of a pessary and, and a tampon for incontinence. There's pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, there's some a newer things, some shorts I'll show a picture of in a chair. So all of, all of, a lot of these things are either um, trying to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles or they are trying to compress the urethra. So I'm just going to go over this. Somebody obviously sideways. This is the pubic bone, the bladder. 
the urethra, that two, um, there's vagina and rectum, and then the dark red is the pelvic floor muscles. So our bones, our pelvic bone is like a circle, and it has a muscle hammock attached to the bone, that bone. And the, this is, so this, excuse me, this is the muscle hammock that's supporting the, you know, all those organs. And so as we, as we age, that and for any good childbirth and other things, that muscle can be torn, it can be get weaker. And so some of the things I'm going to go through to help women with incontinence, particularly stress incontinence, um, are focused on strengthening the pelvic floor muscles. And so let's see what's first. So I might just stand up because I think I can talk louder when I stand up. So um, I can point. But, so physical therapy is an option a lot of people don't think about. When I finished my residency, I went to the, to the UK to work with a, a urologic surgeon there for a little while, and women wait about a year to have surgery in the UK. Um, and so, but in the meantime, they all do physical therapy. They see, they call them a physio. And about when they studied, uh, these ladies who are going to physical therapy, and by the time they would get where the surgery would a year, you know, they've waited a year, uh, about half of them would not want surgery anymore because they and their symptoms are better enough that they are satisfied. They might not be cured, as you can see. So, um, so in, in this particular study, they felt like about 30% of women who have stress, SUI, I shouldn't have left that in there, sorry, SUI stands for stress, urinary incontinence. And about a third of women who have that incontinence, they, if we ask them to do a Kegel exercise or squeeze the, those muscles of the pelvic floor, they can't do it um, in this study. And if they, have, if they do physical therapy, they had improvement rates of about 50 to 70 percent, in improvement in leakage. And so cure rates, they were listing at 15 to 30 percent, but a high, high dropout rate. So one thing about doing exercise for the pelvic floor is that if you stop doing the exercises, your, your incontinence symptoms will come back. So um, it is something that you have to, ma you have to maintain. Um, and it's time. I mean, it takes time and it's habits and, and, and it's a strange idea. A lot of Americans, I feel like we're not used to taking the long way around. Uh, and so sometimes when I say to people, you can go see a physical therapist, they kind of look at me in a funny way. But we do have several um, in town, so maybe at least two ladies in town that I work with and have for a while who do physical therapy for. And there's one joining the group across the street. Yeah. So some, there are options. And I, I think they're, I'm a big fan of people trying it, if they're comfortable trying it. Um, I mentioned vaginal combs. And I love that name, lady, <laughs> lady system. I don't know. I've never had any patient try vaginal combs, but they're little weighted combs that um, women will wear, and that those muscles are contracting to try to hold that cone in place. They start with the lightest weight, and they go to the higher weights. So oh, weighted combs have been around a long time. Yeah. Um, so how do they work? Well, you don't know. You start. I know. I've never. I've never prescribed them. I think people. I think women can get them on their own. Or maybe the physical therapist will. Okay. So it's part of physical therapy. It could be. I haven't had anybody use them, so, but they, but it's. Okay. And they're still around, so. They're still around. I think the idea is to start with a very low weight, and if it's there, you're, those muscles are trying to hang on to it, so you can kind of wear it walking around. Do they go inside of you or what? They do. Oh, okay. They go inside you, and they have little, they'll get a little heavier. Each one will get a little heavier. So you just work to keep that in. Yep, you work to exactly. That's a good way of putting it. You work to keep that in. And you had it. You had this for a It was still working. Uh, so I just move that. So a hysterectomy. This is a uterus. So a hysterectomy would kind of remove this here, but everything below that is is still there. Actually marketed to patients, so I don't think you need it for 
prescription for the these Innovo shorts. They have been around, I would estimate, about five or six years. I think they're the price is about two hundred dollars, and they deliver. Um, they have this. They deliver electric shocks to your pelvic floor, so they're trying to strengthen those muscles um, by. Uh, I don't know what the right words are. <laughs> they have shocks to those muscles, and you wear them like maybe twenty minutes a day. Electricity will, will cause those muscle contractions, and you don't have to do anything. You know, you don't have to do anything. It's the same principle. So you're going to wear these shorts with these little electrodes that are going to shock those muscles. And it probably feels like tingling. I remember meeting the. I went to a meeting about five years ago, and the, they had these shorts there, and they had the reps there. Yeah, exactly. But, so it's kind of like doing a bunch of those exercises. But like we, I, they slide before said so a lot of women can't do those exercises. I could tell them, go to your cables, but they can't, they're not able to squeeze that muscle. I, I would say. Yeah. So then you would just have to wear these all the time. Because no, you said it's like you 20 stop. minutes a day. Oh, it's just 20 minutes a Something day. Something like that, yes. So you don't wear them all the time. And How, so what's the effectiveness of this? It's good. Work. It's a good question. <laughs> have I you guys ever done any hard. kind of yeah. electrotherapy for, for uh, something else? So I did it for swallow, swallowing, and it was really effective. Oh, so interesting. I also have not had that I tried shorts. So I think they're relatively new. I wish I could remember the data. I think it's pretty good. It's pretty good. They teach you to swallow. And it just helps to strengthen the incontinence chair. And this one I couldn't find. For articles on effectiveness, and I, I did not find a lot. I, I think the studies are limited. What happens in that chair? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 does chair? <laughs> what does the chair do? <laughs> so it's the same principle as the electricity. It's oh. trying to strengthen those muscles, only it uses a magnet. And it, they advertise it as being just like doing thousands of pelvic floor muscle control. So you just sit on it and it just does all that. That's it just does all. That's the idea behind it. With it's a magnet and no electrical shock. No shocks. Oh, I'm like a business. <laughs> <laughs> so the appealing things are you because you're fully clothed. You go sit in a chair. You don't feel well, you supposedly don't feel any different, but it is it is expensive. I I tried to find out does Medicare cover the Recently, people would say recently, yes, they do. It, it tends to be, I think the data is kind of limited. So when I, you know, when I was looking, well, where are these chairs? How can you go do the chair? And they're usually in offices that are doing things like Botox and oh, I don't know, and they're kind of fluffy sort kind of, of things. Aesthetic. Aesthetic things. I, I could derm if I be maybe a dermatologist, which I think is so strange. Why would the dermatologist office have one of these chairs? But, and they're expensive, so usually there people will go and pay maybe a hundred to two hundred dollars per session. Oh, and wow. it takes several sessions. I I'm not convinced on the chair, but but the waiting room didn't have a whole. So if you go into a clinic and use a chair, yes. Oh, okay. You're on. Yeah, you're on there. That would be hard to explain to everybody. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So interesting. <laughs> You know they're yes. they're trying new things. Yeah. So that's nice to know. So pessaries are little uh, devices that normally when I've used a pessary for someone, it is to hold their organs up, like their bladder, what whatever is holding up. But they make one uh, with a knob. It's a ring pessary with a knob, and the idea is for the this knob to sit right under the bladder and compress the urethra. So while you're wearing it. Urine can't escape as easily and it holds urine in. But it's something that uh, ladies would keep at home and put in themselves and take out and wash and put in the next day or whenever they feel like they need that. They can. So it works by compressing the urethra. They make some tampons for bladder as bladder support and they come in some different sizes. And that's the same, the same as the pet.
accessory, just trying to compress the urethra. Oh, really? So, like maybe, maybe if someone's going to run or get on the trampoline with their kids or go to an aerobics class, you know, this, these I think might be a good option. Because mm -hmm. you might not, might not be comfortable to wear that for a, all day, but it would be fine for a couple of hours. So the, and then with stress incontinence, there are some surgical options. So, um, and actually, there are many over the over the years. If you look at the decades, many many surgical options. Probably the more the most common one in the last couple of decades is called a suburethral sling. So remember that urethra is that tube that is carrying your from the bladder to the outside, and the sling is acts like a little hammock right underneath. It. Picture, a little hammock right underneath the urethra, and I think I have a picture later. Um, and I'll just talk about that when I get there. There's also something called a retropubic repair or a birch repair, which is an abdominal, typically an abdominal surgery. Um, and then some urologists will do collagen injections in the urethra to sort of that tube to just bulk it up so it's um, not so open and letting urine escape too easily. So the sling, the couple kinds of sling, a trans, the more recent ones are transvaginal tape or transobturator tape. It, it provides support for the for the mid urethra. So this is the bladder and the urethra, and then this is the blue represents the tape. Um, so it is. I tell people it's, it's a mesh. It's like the if you get a big bag of oranges at the grocery store, it comes in that mesh bag but it's tiny mesh and it's about a centimeter wide and it's placed um, by, often by maybe a urologist or urogynecologist, some gynecologist might you place these and the, it just sits like, it's supposed to be kind of a loose little hammock and it, a couple, I won't go into all the details about the difference between the two, um, but they're very similar and it, about nine out of 10 ladies will have relief with it, it might not be, they might not be completely dry, but they're satisfied. So that was kind of a game changer when that became available. Um, and then, so that was all. I'm I sorry, can I go back? Yes. So is that a surgery? That's a surgery, yes. Did right. you say they go in through the abdominal cavity for that? Not or? on that one. Okay. Um, a retropubic repair. Oh, okay, so okay. Not work, work soon, but that would, so when they started doing these, it made some of the more invasive procedures kind of less, less popular. So mm -hmm. less, less, I'm not even sure they do some of these things anymore, some of the right. abdominal things. But this goes, the tape um, actually is attached to these needles, and you put the needles in this kind of safe spaces away from the organs, and it's like a little little hammock in there. It's so interesting. It's a, and it just holds it up. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we like so. What the idea is that when you cough, and normally if things would be kind of falling, yeah. this doesn't let them fall. Oh, okay. So fall. is that more recent? I know my mother had something that was more invasive done and mm -hmm. didn't work. Is that? So is this? This is more recent. Oh, okay. So about maybe twenty. So she had something before that. She well, probably like had a retropubic repair. Uh, um, yeah, I, just, I, I don't know what it was. It was a really long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah, but, was, you know, my, my sister's looking at doing something that, yeah. And, so, and this, these are mainly for stress incontinence. And I, I always wanted patients to make, to realize that if they have urge incontinence also, this might, it, it varies, but it may not fix that part completely. And so I always kind of liked them to try the less invasive things before yeah. surgery. I was like, you can, these other things can't really hurt you. You know, going to the physical therapist or trying some exercise or uh, pessary, they can't really hurt you. With surgery, they can rarely have some complications. So I usually like folks to try the um, easier things first if they can. Mm -hmm. But it, this isn't as has been a nice procedure, um, has had some good longevity, and um, 
But you my God, going over the different kinds of incontinence again. So stress incontinence is like leaking when you cough, sneeze, laugh, okay. stand. Urge incontinence is when that muscle wall around the bladder wants to start contracting and squeezing urine out when you're not ready. Like maybe you know you have to go to the bathroom. The toilet is over there and you just got out of your car, but you can't make it on time. Right. Because yeah. you're in your bladder okay. like, oh, here we go, okay. and start leaking out. Mm -hmm. Does the bladder have its own brain? That's <laughs> a good point. In a, in a sense, it does. So when you're a toddler and you're or potty trained, your brain takes over from the bladder. So your brain takes charge and it's gonna tell you, it's gonna tell your bladder when it's okay to squeeze the urine out. And you know, it's a complex uh, order of events. Um, and so, so every, you know, most people are potty trained, and, but as we, a variety of things, age or a variety of other things, something allows the bladder to kind of take charge. You right. know? And then the bladder is confidence because the bladder, that muscle just gets irritated by something. I've experienced where I can hold it if I'm shopping, but then as soon as I drive into the uh, garage. Oh, oh, me too. Oh, just <laughs> no yeah. way, no way it's not get to me. And yeah. the bladder is making that choice. Yes. 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 Yeah. It's true. It yeah. just kind of yeah. starts to, yeah. yeah, it's almost like it goes backwards a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that's a, that's a good way to put it. It has a brain, a mind of its own. It's yes. like a little metal yes. on your brain. Too. So where does he fit into that? Where does that kind of incontinence fit? That's in? urge. 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 So these are these are more common. This yeah. is less common. But okay. this, the overflow means someone someone can't empty well, and so their bladder just gets overfull, and it gets kind of so overfull that urine just starts leaking out, and so you might. But yeah, like if someone has overflow incontinence, it might look a little like stress incontinence. Like they maybe they any little pressure pushes that extra urine out. But they you wouldn't want to have them have a sling, you know, received. You wouldn't want to do anything to close off that urethra anymore. So it is important in the evaluation to know what kind of incontinence is someone not even know. And then mixed incontinence is usually a mixture of these okay. two. And then slide at the end, there are some folks who have incontinence because of a neurologic disorder. They might have multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, and they are maybe a spinal cord injury, and they'll have urine loss because of those problems. Um, does that all Yes, clear? thank you. Yes. taking a water pill, maybe they have high blood pressure and they're taking a water pill, but it's making them make a lot of urine. Maybe they have the option to be on a different high blood pressure medicine. They could talk to their family doctor about that. Some women, are, maybe they need to limit the fluid amount of fluid they take in. So we, uh, there's not very good information on how much water people should drink. We kind of grow up with uh, eight, eight ounce glasses a day, and certainly they're we want people to be dehydrated. We don't want them to be dehydrated. But occasionally, people over overhydrate, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if they have bladder issues. I find that they start overhydrating, and it makes their bladder problems worse sometimes. So your urine should be probably dark in the morning, but then kind of pale yellow during the day. If it's always clear, then you might be getting too much. Someone might be getting too much water if they're always drinking. And it's hard when people get used to drinking a lot. Cut back on the water because they feel uncom so uncomfortable, feel thirsty all the time. There. If someone has a bladder infection or a chronic bladder infection that needs to be treated, caffeine is a common bladder irritant. So I think that's great. One of the first things I ask people is how much caffeine, tea, coffee, soda, chocolate actually is an irritant to the bladder, um, and I ask them to cut back on their caffeine or even sometimes eliminate. There is something called a mul I think this is only I think there are more slides later, but there's something called bladder retraining. So if someone's kind of 
looked at some of these other options. Are fluid this good? They're not drinking late at night. They're avoiding caffeine. Sometimes we're, it's that matter of the brain, this brain and the bladder brain, and you can do something called bladder retraining. Right? And this is probably best for people that have what we call an overactive bladder. It's a little different from it's not necessarily incontinence, but the overactive bladder is one where you have to go all the time. And it's like your bladder is telling you you have to go, but maybe you go, but there's really not that much urine in your bladder. Yeah. So some of it is habit, like you get in the habit of going, this is not true for everybody. But so some people can learn to extend the length of time between voids, and they're kind of taking charge over their bladder again. Um, for the bladder retraining, there are medications you I heard. I think I have a list with some of, some of the more common medications listed, but the medications for bladder are trying to relax that muscle wall around the bladder. They're trying to keep it from wanting to squeeze. Um, I think they are um, medications that are not always everyday medications. So I would tell patients, if you want to try this, it's okay to take it on a day you're going to be out shopping, or maybe you're going to be traveling. But if you're at home and you're close to the bathroom, you might, you might not need it that day. We'll talk a little more about those because they have some significant side effects. So, and then, but that those are medications, that, like a pill that you would take. And then there's something called Interstim, which is a sacral nerve stimulation that done by special urologists that, that will insert some little uh, kind of like electrodes to innervate the nerves that are innervating the bladder to help that bladder muscle be calm and not be always wanting to contract. I'm not, I'm not going to go into that way. That's not, not very many people are going to get to that level of need. So, the lifestyle things I ask folks to think about, we limit excess food, limit caffeine, chocolate, um, sometimes keeping a voiding diary. There's something called, uh, there's a condition called interstitial cystitis. Um, and, that, and that is, I usually tell people, I don't think you have this, but there's a diet that goes along with this that might help with overactive bladder. And so sometimes if women will look up an IC diet, and it is a diet that they generally avoid acidic things like citrus, vinegar, um, wine, chocolate. I can't I remember all the things that those are. Tomatoes, I think it's kind of this more acidic thing. So ask those patients to avoid those. People with interstitial cystitis have a lot of bladder pain and frequency avoiding. Um, so that can be a useful sometimes. You talk about bladder retraining a little bit where you have kind of time voiding and you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to go at 8 and I can't, I'm not going to go again until 9. And then you, about, you extend that by about 15 minutes. Um, and again, this is something after you've ruled out all the other things. You know, you've ruled out infection, you've ruled out bladder stones, you know, you know that you can't find any other good reason other than this is a habit that I've gotten into of voiding all the time. Um, these are the some names of common medications that help kind of calm the bladder down. You might have heard of Diprepan or Dipol. That's the care is the one I usually use. Um, Nervetric is newer. They all um, act on some receptors in the bladder. A receptor is like a little protein on the surface of a cell that responds to messages. Um, and the one difficulty with these medications is that the medications act on these receptors, but the receptors it's working on are in other parts of your body. And so these medications cause, unfortunately, dry mouth and dry eyes and um, sometimes some confusion and, and they cause some other problems. So over the, and they've been around a long time, so over the decades they keep trying to make it work. Gosh, can we just affect the bladder only and not all these other parts of the body so they're getting better. And they work for some people, and they don't work for other people. So, um, let's see. And then we, we talked a little about overflow and contest. So, if someone's bladder is not emptying well, they might need to address any prolapse that they have. So, if their bladder is really falling down far and it just can't get in position to empty well, um, some women will even 
be at a point where they, they need to put a little catheter in periodically to empty their bladder completely. It's called self-catheterization. Um, and so maybe someone's had multiple surgeries and their bladder is just, just too, everything's too tight for the urine to get out. So they might actually, when they avoid it, they might actually, after they empty what they can, they'll put a little catheter in and, and empty the rest. Hmm. It's not an easy thing, but... Um, she doesn't like, could the bladder collapse if you could say you were a runner or a jogger? So I that is possible. Yeah. I don't, haven't seen that too often. Uh, So someone whose uterus wants to fall out because everything gets relaxed, another word for prolapse is um, pelvic relaxation. So all the connective tissue that should be holding those organs in place has gotten relaxed, you know, and over time. And so it wants to just let everything kind of fall out. And so I find those ladies, often they had great deliveries, they had fast labors, they pushed those babies out because everything is very stretchy. But um, but later in life, everything stays stretchy because that's just how their connective tissue is. It was, it was not stretchy, but it was maybe the first one. So <laughs> yes. it's maybe not for everybody. Everybody doesn't get that advantage, maybe. But, but so yes, and it goes together. So even even ladies who have, let's say they have surgery and they have everything tucked back up, they have about a twenty percent chance in five years of having it come. So to some degree, it may not bother them is still, but it's just that that's the kind of connective tissue that they have. And there are some good things about it and some, and some hard things about it. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And then I, I mentioned briefly neurogenic incontinence, so I'm not going to address that. Um, and then I, incontinence products, so Nancy was going to talk to us about that, but clearly and everyone knows that, you know, pads, Liners, poise pads, adult diapers, um, and Nancy, if you're ready, it would be great for you to talk to us. Well, I actually uh, got interested in this because I had a customer that called, and she said she had found this wonderful product online, and would I please get it so she could pick it up at the store? So I have just made a little bit of some uh, brochures that tells you a little bit about it. Uh, and I'll certainly leave some with you then. I can pass the stuff over. Thank you. So basically what it is, you can use this both if you're a young person that's having periods, instead of a tampon or a, tampon, uh, a pad, you can actually, sure. Yeah. You can actually uh, use that instead. Now, this company is particularly concerned about the environment, so these are reusable, and they use all planet-friendly products. So you can use this, and if depending on how much usage you have, it depends on how many times you can use them, but they're meant to use, and then you simply rinse it until it rinses clear. Then you can toss it into the washer and wash it. And so you can reuse these 20 to, to 25 times uh, before you have to get another one. So it's, it's, the good thing is it does not look like it depends. It just looks like a pinty. Now you have uh, this one, the ones I ordered from my store have fuller coverage. There's some that are uh, kind of bikini-ish. Uh, I think most of, at least I would not want a bikini-ish. Uh, but this is the, the least amount of um, uh, our light mm -hmm. absorption, mm -hmm. and so you can see what it's like. They have one for uh, night as well, or I should say overnight, and then in between where it's uh, the in-between kind. And Alice that works for me said, be sure to get them back in the right box. <laughs> you know Alice. <laughs> Well, some of the ones on TV are really different than this, but this is the medium amount, and this is the overnight. 
So what it does, it has layers of cotton, <laughs> and then it has one that is, um, you know, kind of a, a liner that prevents any leakage of the fruit. You might have to change it several times again. Is this no, medium no, or? No. Uh, the first one I sent by was light, so that would be the second one. And that would be, uh, would it be helpful to have them all three together? So this is light, medium, and then overnight. But is this, think about it, how much it absorbs. Uh, it's, it's multiple times what its weight is. So uh, I, I just don't, it depends on how much somebody loses. If it's a little bit, well, this is all. But the young girls, and, um, yeah, my daughter here, uh, uses them for a period. Yeah, instead of using oh. a tampon or even a, uh, a period. Yeah, and then you just rinse them. Yeah. So, uh, you don't, yeah. you say rinse. You're, you're, you rinse under cool water <laughs> until it runs runs clear. Uh -huh. Then you can just wash them like you would do your own. Uh, okay. Wash right. But eventually they do wear out after 20 to 30 wearing sets. So it's simple. They're, they're not, it's not going to be like the lingerie that you buy and you wear it until all the elastics go yeah. and you still keep wearing it. You can't do that. No. But this is a, a nice, I mean, if you, there was a lady that the husband came into the store. She has some form of dementia and I can't tell you what it is. Um, she seems still coherent to me. I've known her, she was brilliant. Yeah. And, but she now has become incontinent, and the husband is totally clueless. He has no concept of anything. So he came in, because we were friends, um, and um, he said, what do I get her? And so at that point, the only thing I knew to say, because they were going on a trip, and he didn't want the embarrassment of her having incontinence. And so, um, I said, well, the only thing I know of is dependence. I didn't know of any place selling something like this. And so she went with him and she refused. She said, absolutely not, she wouldn't do that. So this looks like a painting. Mm -hmm. And it, you, you wear it under your clothes, nobody really knows, but it protects you from having that visible Are they picture. Only in black? This brand, it only at this point, is only in black. So what if you wear white pants? You, you would be unless they were very thick white pants. Uh, 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 no, you don't in the white pants. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but that's, I, I am assuming this is very new uh, for the company. I'm assuming that they will uh -huh. pr produce other shades, colors, and that sort of thing. But right now, this is what they're doing. I'll leave you even more. Okay, and this, I'm going to have to So they're made of cotton? They're, yes, yeah. and bamboo. So the bamboo is very, it's renewable and it's very yes. soft. Okay. The skin won't be in our tongue. And that's, it's fairly simple. It is. Yeah. Oh, you might want to know the prices. Um, it's on here. Uh, the, I have glasses right here. This is the model rib, it's, does it say 38 on it? 35, 35, 35, 95. 37, 37 for the overloaded. And I can't tell you why, but I can guess a little more stuff in there. Yeah, and then this one is 37. Oh, this says 37 too. Oh, they all do say 37. Yeah, they're all 37. Well, okay. It mm -hmm. seems like one would be more than the other, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, maybe at some point they'll come down in price, but right now that's pretty competitive to what the others are online, plus you pay shipping. Well, that's really not that, but more than a tub to hand. I mean, no, yeah. once you buy them, no. Mm -hmm. If you buy them to hand, you spend that much, ever so many. Mm -hmm. And they, they look bulky and they, they they don't fit well under uh, slacks and that sort of thing. This is more like a painting. That's, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, if I go back to the very first customer, I'll, I'll tell you this, and I, I'm just heart sick 
because I called her and I said, you know, you asked me to get this and I couldn't get that one you wanted because they won't sell in a store. They only sell online. And the, the price was very similar. I said, I want you to know I have these in my store. I just talked to her before I came over. And there was this pause and she said, um, you know, I can only, my bladder doesn't work now and I have to have a catheter all the time. Oh. And I was just heart sick. And I listening to this, I thought, I wonder what of those would work for them. Yeah. So we really have to do our cables now. This could get serious. Mm -hmm. I don't know what her problem was and what caused it. I, I think it may have been some previous surgeries involved. But, you know, I don't get, I, I get a lot of information from customers, but not all of it. Right. But uh, I, it, I was just sad for her mm -hmm. because I was so hoping that you know, we could find a, a semi-solution. Mm -hmm. Are you all doing your cables right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> One thing I didn't mention is that the, with cables, it should be 15 repetitions three times a day. So 15 repetitions three times a day. I tell people, like, on your way somewhere in the morning at lunch, so we good. Have for a dinner. And it, it takes about eight weeks to make a difference. So don't give up. I and how many difference. did you say? Fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, Three, times Three times a day. Three times a day. Oh. It's more of a I've done it this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking about it. It's more of a habit. If that's all it takes, <laughs> we're set. <laughs> we just have to be reminded. <laughs> it's interesting. There's all kinds of apps that you can get on your phone. So if you have a smartphone, you can get an app that will remind you to do it every several days. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Any other questions for Amy? Thank you so much. That was really good. Thank you. Very good.